the Julius Rabinovitz Center, um, the Griswold Center, and the Economic History Workshop here at Princeton. Uh, my name is Stephen Redding. I'm a professor in the Economics Department and the School of Public Policy. And it's my great pleasure, a great honor to introduce uh, Harold James today. Um, as you all know, Harold is the Claude and Lord Kelly Professor in European Studies in the Department of History and the School of Public and International Affairs. He's also Director of the Program in Contemporary European Politics and Society. And today he'll be talking about his latest book on making a modern central bank, the Bank of England from 1979 to 2003. Uh, this was a period of great change, including large scale financial deregulation in the 1980s. And of course, the Bank of England's move to independence in 1998. Um, and many of the themes the book raises uh, connect with a broader public debate, which is of great contemporary relevance about credibility and commitment in monetary policy and the rationale for delegating what some see to be political decisions uh, to groups of economic experts. Um, the book has been described as authoritative by Martin Wolf, insightful and brilliant uh, by Adair Turner. Um, and it's my great uh, pleasure to introduce Harold, who's going to talk for around 30 minutes uh, before leaving some time for questions and discussion afterwards. And so Harold, ha handing over to you. Well, uh, th thank you so much, uh, Stephen. Um, it's, it's, it's wonderful to see you all. Um, and uh, I, I can see some of your faces on the, on the Zoom. It's a great honor to be able to do this. Um, I've got a few slides that I thought uh, I would uh, uh, show to um, guide us through this, to this talk. Um, I'm basically reflecting uh, on a book uh, that covers the history of the Bank of England uh, from the late 1970s uh, to the early 2000s, in other words, just to the eve of the financial crisis. I don't deal with the financial crisis because uh, the book is based on archival documents and uh, there's, there's basically a 20-year release rule. Um, uh, I, I went slightly beyond the 20 years, uh, but uh, I, I didn't get into the the period of the financial crisis itself. Um, the theme of the book, um, uh, maybe uh, it would be good just to give that at the, at the beginning. And uh, I, I start with this. this, this is just the first paragraph of the, the book, that uh, in the late 70s, uh, the Bank of England was a kind of microcosm of the UK. It was steeped in history, but confused about its identity and inconstant in its performance. Um, I, I, I remember, and it's included in the book as well, I had a, a wonderful conversation with our, our colleague, our distinguished colleague, uh, Angus, uh, Angus Deaton. Um, and Angus gave me the story of how he started at the bank in the late 1960s and said it was like going back to a primary school, elementary school in Scotland um, and a really strict disciplinarian sat the new recruits down and made them add up columns of figures in ink uh, with uh, just a, a, a kind of mental arithmetic process. Um, and, and then, as, as Stephen said in the introduction, um, there was a great transformation, and it's a transformation that affects the whole of the UK. Uh, but the bank became more modern, and the idea is that particular powers get delegated. And uh, by the early 2000s, um, the Bank of England looked as if it was uh, an example of the, what was I think considered the best practice of a modern central bank uh, with a clear rule-based system based around an inflation target. Um, and uh, uh, again, uh, one of our former colleagues, uh, Paul Krugman, uh, thought of the bank uh, hitting uh, uh, far above its weight in terms of intellectual power. Another way of presenting uh, this story is um, by thinking of uh, the inflation performance of the uh, of the UK um, in the in the last uh, sixty years, um, you can see uh, that the UK is in some ways an outlier in terms of its international performance on inflation. Um, in the nineteen seventies, uh, it has rates of inflation that are far far higher uh, than those in other industrial countries. Um, the year that I started uh, my, my undergraduate degree in, in Cambridge University, 
um, the inflation rate was almost 25% um, in 1975. Um, in the late 1970s, after the second oil price shock, it's again higher uh, than in other industrial countries. Um, in the early 90s, um, higher inflation rates again. Um, and uh, even in the immediate aftermath of the financial crisis, there's less of a dip in inflation uh, than in, in other countries. So inflation and the war against inflation is quite central to the story of the uh, UK. Um, but it's also a question about defining the responsibility of an institution. And characteristically, I think, if you want to think about what, uh, what an institution should do, um, we're used to the idea that you look at the legislation that creates the institution. Um, so for the United States, the uh, 1913 Federal Reserve Act uh, lays down a kind of simple criterion uh, uh, to provide for the establishment of Federal Reserve Banks to furnish an elastic currency and so on. Um, and in the 1970s, the, uh, the, the aim, uh, the, the goals of the uh, uh, system are uh, then clearly stated in terms of the dual mandate um, in 1977. Or the Bundesbank law in Germany in 1957 talks about securing the currency. Or the the um, ECB statute uh, has the primary objective should be the maintenance of uh, price stability. Um, so, the, I mean, these are the, 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 these are clear objectives. But if you looked in the legislation um, that uh, established the Bank of England, um, you don't see anything like this. Uh, the um, uh, if you look at the original statute in 1694, uh, the Bank of England was part of a series of measures that was supposed to carry out a war against France, against Louis XIV's France. Um, and uh, the subsequent legislation in the 19th century that really made a modern central bank uh, in uh, 1844 and specified the way in which note issue uh, should operate the Peel Act, or Robert Peel's Act, um, doesn't doesn't give any purpose that the bank should exist for um, the 1946 Act, which provided for the nationalization of the bank uh, previously, uh, privately owned bank, um, also uh, doesn't, doesn't say anything about what the purpose of the institution is. And so it's only in the 1990s um, that people inside the bank start to draw up a list of what the purposes of the bank might be. Um, and the three purposes that were initially defined in 1990. And this is just, remember, it's not a, a legislative definition at this stage. It's, it's just an internal um, uh, statement of purpose. Um, the first one is the stabilization of the value of the currency um, as the necessary precondition for the achievement of the government's wider economic goals. And that looks very much like the Bundesbank uh, law or like the ECB statute, which is also talking about um, a price stability mandate, um, but within the framework of a economic policy that is set by the government in the case of Germany or the governments in, in the case of the European Union. Uh, but they add then uh, two more purposes, the maintenance of stability in the financial system, uh, secondly, um, and thirdly, uh, the promotion of the efficiency and effectiveness of the UK's financial services sector. Um, you know, when you look at that, uh, you start to think, well, is that quite appropriate? Because after all, the central bank is supposed to be in the interests of the whole of the British economy and the whole of British society. Um, and it's not supposed to promote particularly one part of society whose interests may be at variance, at odds with uh, those of the rest of society. So um, the third uh, purpose was always a bit uh, 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 
controversial um, and was dropped then in the 2000s. Um, so it's in 1998 um, that you really get a decisive break. This is the Bank of England Act that was promised within days of the election of a new Labour government in 1997, uh, the government where Tony Blair was the Prime Minister and uh, uh, Gordon Brown, uh, the Finance Minister or Chancellor of the Exchequer. And uh, you look at this and it looks very much like the, um, the central banks in other places, uh, maintain price stability, subject to that to support the economic policy of Her Majesty's government, including its objectives for growth and employment. Um, but then other parts of the uh, Act um, took away um, banking supervision authority. Um, and uh, so the financial stability mandate, uh, which is still there, really gets watered down by the separation out of financial regulation and supervision. Um, and it's only put back in the aftermath of the financial crisis. Um, so in part, this is a story of different styles of communication. Um, in the beginning, in the 1970s, in this kind of really old fashioned world that uh, Angus was uh, recalling, um, it's very much in terms of um, writing, uh, written memoranda um, and uh, written memoranda that are part of a, a kind of uh, con conjoined system of economic governance uh, where the bank is, is basically part of a network with the British Treasury. And it doesn't really make sense to think of the bank and the Treasury as very separate uh, in their, their um, uh, their, their functions. And this is the kind of characteristic memorandum uh, that you, you, you had in the 1970s. Uh, this is from somebody who actually also wrote a history of the Bank of England, uh, John Ford. Um, and uh, it's in, interesting, I think, in, in the sense that uh, it makes very clear how much monetary policy is concerned with debt management, um, and in that sense, uh, Ford also talked about there being what he called a macroeconomic executive, which was the treasury and the bank uh, combined uh, together. Um, in the 1980s, um, there's a, a sort of rather different style of how to communicate. Um, uh, it's much more about verbal communication. Um, the two people who were the the big stars of the bank in the 1980s and were both tipped uh, to be future governors. Um, uh, Eddie George did become the governor in 1993. Uh, David Walker didn't. Um, uh, but they were both uh, people who were superb communicators in terms of speaking. Um, uh, George, uh, people talked about his silver tongue uh, Eddie, uh, David Walker was called uh, Walker the Talker. Um, uh, they, they, they were they, they were really uh, persuasive, and um, above all, Eddie George, who was then a relatively junior um, official at the Bank of England in the early 1980s, um, became so important because he was the only person who was really capable of explaining in a verbal dialogue with the Prime Minister, uh, with Margaret Thatcher, who was intensely interested in monetary policy to an absolutely unique extent, uh, unprecedented either before or after um, of the Prime Minister's engagement in the making of monetary policy. And a lot of that is, 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 is documented and set out in the book. The older Bank of England officials were simply tongue-tied, couldn't, couldn't present a case. Um, and uh, George knew how to talk the language of markets and uh, it talked effectively uh, to the Chancellor, um, but also to, to the Prime Minister. Um, in the 1990s, the ki kind of communication switches to what it really becomes uh, and after the independence and uh, what it still is. Uh, so the critical uh, story is from the middle of the 1990s, the publication of an inflation report. Um, 
that was great from the point of view of the bank, um, which was not yet independent. Um, but the inflation report was simply a presentation uh, with a lot of uh, numerical material and a lot of statistics and a, a visual presentation uh, with a range of future inflation outcomes. And there was nothing there that the Treasury could alter. Um, so the kind of censorship of bank communications that took place in the 70s or 80s uh, by, by the Treasury um, isn't relevant anymore in the inflation report, and it's still really the primary way in which the bank uh, lets its uh, view be known to the world, to the markets. Um, you can see, uh, obviously, in this uh, relatively recent example of the inflation report or the successor of the inflation report from August 2020, uh, quite how much wider the projected ranges of inflation uh, are as a result of the uncertainty generated by the COVID crisis. Um, the big theme of the book, I think, is um, about the internationalization of central banking. Um, it looks as if there are foreign models of how central banking can be done better uh, than in the UK. Um, in the 1980s, uh, the primary, the most attractive uh, foreign model uh, is the German uh, Bundesbank. Uh, if you look back to my inflation chart, you can see how uh, Germany gets lower inflation outcomes in the uh, 70s than any other country. Um, and uh, the figure here in the foreground, uh, Karl Otto Pöhl, is the central banker who for a long time uh, Mrs. Thatcher admired more than other central bankers. And uh, she, she basically told the Bank of England to behave more uh, like, the, like the Bundesbank and uh, like uh, Karl Otto Pöhr. Um, uh, but the, the really crucial figure, I think, um, is more and more uh, the, uh, the, the chairman of the Fed, um, uh, Paul Volcker, um, and then uh, after 1987, um, Alan Greenspan. And um, Alan Greenspan uh, plays a really quite important part in this, this story, uh, if, if you want to follow it up in the book. Um, I mean, first of all, um, Alan Greenspan uh, was called in by the UK Treasury and uh, by the Bank of England in order to persuade Mrs. Thatcher in 1990 um, that it would be a good idea to join the European monetary system, to join a fixed exchange rate regime in order to get a counter-inflationary discipline. Um, and the argument that Alan Greenspan used was a characteristic uh, one, a rather odd one, I think, to most people, uh, which is that the European monetary system resembled the 19th century gold standard and the gold standard was good in the sense that it imposed an external discipline or a, a spine. Uh, he called it the spine theory and uh, Mrs. Thatcher enthusiastically took up the spine theory. Later in the 1990s, um, Alan Greenspan is a key interlocutor uh, for the then opposition figures, uh, Gordon Brown, the shadow chancellor, um, and his uh, advisor, Ed Balls. Um, they go repeatedly to Washington in order to look at the Fed to talk to Greenspan and uh, think about the way in which a Fed model uh, could be applied uh, to the UK if the Labour Party came into, into, into office. And the idea is that um, it, it would immediately strengthen the credibility of monetary policy to have an independent central bank and uh, change expectations in a way that would push down interest rates and consequently allow a cheaper financing of the government debt. So it's also the idea of an external constraint, um, a, a spine theory um, of a slightly different form. And you can see that, I think, in this, this figure that I took from a paper from uh, my colleagues and, and friends, uh, Mike Bordeaux and Pierre Seacloss, um, 
about uh, the credibility of uh, monetary policy, and it goes in two stages, really. Uh, one is to get out of the very, very high inflation levels of the uh, late 1970s, um, and the other is to get out of another surge of inflation in the late 1980s. Um, and uh, in this measure, it's actually a, a, a kind of crucial part of the story. Between 90 and 92, a very relatively brief period from October 92, uh, I'm sorry, October 1990 to September 92, um, the uh, British currency uh, is linked into the European uh, monetary system in an exchange rate mechanism um, and uh, falls out in a dramatic crisis in September 92. Uh, but that moment is really crucial uh, to establishing credibility. And that's that's the moment that credibility really comes in. And after that, it's easier to go, once policy is liberated, as it were, after September 1992, uh, into an inflation uh, targeting regime uh, that was again taken from another central bank, uh, this time a very small central bank uh, from the example of New Zealand. Um, a more dramatic part of the story is the, uh, the, the question of the Bank of England's engagement in um, financial supervision and regulation. Um, that's mandated by new legislation by the Banking Act in 1979 and uh, in, in 1987, uh, but it leads to a number of spectacular blow-ups. Um, uh, in the middle of the 1980s, Johnson Matthey, in the early 1990s, uh, BCCI, Bank of Credit and Commerce International, or uh, often alternatively known by a jokey uh, thing, Bank of Crooks and Cocaine International, so in, a bank engaged in a uh, lot of illegal activity, uh, blew up uh, in the early 1990s, in the middle 1990s, uh, the failure of bearings. So there, there are these humiliating failures of um, uh, banking supervision, and uh, part of that is at the background uh, of why the Bank of England is taken out of uh, banking supervision. Um, I think it's partly an unfair story. We can we can talk a little bit about this, uh, but um, it, it's an unfair story in the sense that the failures of banking supervision are well known, but the successes are really only known quite a long time afterwards. And um, indeed, uh, it's the first time in uh, the this story was told in, in this book, uh, so published a few months ago, of the successful rescue of one of the big British clearing banks in the early 1990s, uh, Midland, that uh, was on the brink of failure. Uh, but it's a rescue operation conducted with, in, in such secrecy uh, that nobody knows about it at the time. And uh, Gordon Brown, um, who made a lot of criticism of the bank's uh, uh, supervisory uh, strategies in the 1990s, had no knowledge of, of the rescue of Midland uh, when, it, when it was being done, or when, indeed, when he became Chancellor of the Exchequer. Um, so, uh, you know, part of the story is um, that uh, before the 1980s, uh, the Bank of England had primarily done supervision and regulation in a kind of casual or informal way, uh, which is often called uh, uh, the governor's eyebrows. In other words, if there was a bit of uh, financial activity that the bank thought was inappropriate, uh, the governor would give hints or raise his eyebrows and uh, the action would, uh, would, would stop. Um, but that's a kind of informal regulation that's really incompatible with the world of uh, defining regulation in statutory terms. And that became very clear um, at the beginning of the membership in the European monetary system in October 1990. Uh, there was a little bit of a scandal. Again, it's described in much, much greater detail in the book um, because the uh, way that the market worked in uh, London at the time was with intermediary institutions that stood between the banks and the central bank uh, called discount houses. And the discount houses 
um, the, the chiefs of the discount houses met every week in the bank. Uh, the uh, agents went in every day in order to do operations. And one of the discount houses got a sense on the 5th of October, 1990, uh, that something unusual was happening in the bank and then um, took a very, very substantial position in, uh, in, in uh, treasury bills um, on the expectation that the pound would join the European monetary system, that the, the interest rates would change. Um, and the other uh, discount houses and uh, the banks uh, complained about that and said uh, that this was an example of inside information. It's not really quite inside information in that what they were picking up was uh, all kinds of uh, verbal uh, exuberance, um, enthusiasm, um, different behavior than normal. Um, uh, but uh, it's, it's the kind of thing that really didn't, didn't look right. And so the, the recommendation for that is that um, uh, that, that, that you should stop um, uh, these these uh, the, these informal uh, meetings and just communicate uh, by information that is publicly available at the same time. So these discount houses disappeared, and uh, uh, by the two uh, thousands, uh, they've 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 gone uh, completely. Um, so this this looks like um, the transition to a modern central bank and this was a newspaper cartoon at the time of the uh, bank's independence uh, the bank um, having its leash uh, removed um, jumping off enthusiastically the, 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 the face of the uh, animal that's being released there the dog that's being released is uh, the face of Eddie George um, with Gordon Brown uh, slipping the leash um, uh, is it a complete success? Um, in the early 2000s, it looks spectacularly successful. Um, but I think it's also appropriate to think, uh, you know, aren't some of the issues coming back? And in particular, uh, a number of, of, of points here. Um, the link between fiscal and monetary policy um, becomes much blurrier uh, after the global financial crisis. Um, the idea in 1997, 1998, uh, the original idea behind Gordon Brown is that you delegate monetary policy out and then you subject fiscal policy to a series of rules, but um, the, the, the link uh, gets blurrier. As it gets blurrier, the question of debt management, which was a central function of the Bank of England up to 1998, um, but is then taken away from the bank in 1998, uh, becomes acute again. Um, the question of financial regulation by a central bank uh, becomes much, much more uh, uh, germane to the, the, the policy debates. Uh, can you have a central bank that essentially becomes a monetary policy institute, uh, which is, is where the Bank of England was heading, and doesn't look at what's happening in the financial sector as a whole, um, uh, is, is, is letting that uh, that, that go. Um, if, on the other hand, you bring the financial regulation and supervision back into the bank, um, doesn't that then make the policy mix more complicated? Might monetary policy be altered by considerations of what's good for macro stability? Um, those, are, those are the issues that uh, come back. Um, and uh, even industrial policy, something that the bank was intensely engaged with in the 1970s, had been engaged with since the Great Depression, um, starts to uh, come back again. And, uh, and, and then finally, um, 
you know, this is the dog slipping the leash, uh, but um, what about a, a new kind of issue that just really relatively recently over the past months has come to be at the center of the debate again. Um, so a few days ago, uh, the bank's uh, chief economist, uh, Andy Haldane, um, gave a speech about the return of the big cat, um, the tiger. Uh, nice to talk about tigers, of course, in Princeton. Inflation, a tiger by the tail, which seemed uh, to be a conscious evocation of a compilation of statements on inflation and monetary policy by Hayek in the 1970s um, that was made and it was, it was quite influential in the time. Um, Haldane, um, in the speech on the 26th of February, uh, said that there are few, if any, historical precedents to judge the response of the economy to this scale of shock and degree of policy stimulus. Um, well, few precedents, uh, few historical precedents, uh, I, I'm not sure. I mean, I, in some ways, it looks as if this is has elements, at least, of the 1970s and uh, the debate in the UK and in other countries about how to deal uh, with the, um, the the supply shock uh, produced by the oil crisis. Um, is it a temporary spike? Um, in that case, it's not going to change inflation expectations. And that was one of the main rationales. Um, is it important to, in the face of a supply shock, to increase demand? And many economists in the 1970s um, were making the apparently paradoxical argument, uh, it was presented, for instance, very, very powerfully by Roy Harrod, um, that the way to deal with a supply shock uh, was to increase uh, demand um, and uh, uh, give a fiscal and a monetary stimulus uh, because that would increase the level of supply and thus bring down prices. It looked like a very, very uh, peculiar argument, but some of those arguments are uh, coming back again. Um, and uh, this, is, this is again from uh, Haldane, uh, the comparison of calculations of what we consider output gaps might be, and calculating output gaps is always a very, it's a notoriously difficult exercise at the time. It's easier to tell uh, later on. Um, but you can see a lower output gap um, and a much bigger uh, negative primary balance, uh, much greater. Uh, 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 stimulus then um, uh, from the fiscal side uh, in the response to uh, the the COVID crisis, and so um, these um, the, 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 these features that uh, Haldane points out: um, resurgent demand bumps up against constrained supply. Um, that, that that has a very 1970s touch about it. Um, uh, what's also interesting is uh, Haldane's attention to monetary aggregates uh, in a way that wasn't really usual in the presentation of the bank in the in the 2000s. Um, uh, looking at, at uh, monetary aggregates both on a global and on a um, uh, a, a national level. Um, and then, um, you know, finally thinking about uh, demography, I guess that's taking up a point uh, that was made by, um, in, in this uh, recent book uh, that um, indeed uh, the, the author spoke about it in a, in a seminar in, in, in Princeton and uh, Marcus's seminar a few, few weeks ago. Um, by Charles Goodhart and uh, Mano Pradhan, um, that the the global demography is changing so, so as the, to remove the, uh, the, the the low lowering of wage effects that uh, were were produced by the entry into a global labour supply in the big period of globalization in the 90s and in the 2000s, and that in the view of Goodhart and Pradhan, um, partly explain uh, 
uh, the low inflation convergence of all the all the uh, first the industrial countries and then um, almost every other country as well. And, and finally, uh, the, uh, Haldane talks about uh, deglobalization um, as and th that's also part of the story of the 1970s. Uh, more protectionism, uh, more turning to uh, defensive mechanisms, um, justified in part by the uh, by the uh, discussion of uh, more inflation. So. Um, you know, I, I think it's interesting to, to to see, you know, first of all, how the narrowly defined monetary mandate um, has been diluted uh, after the, uh, the global financial crisis, and secondly, how in the aftermath of this particular shock of the pandemic, um, an old inflation debate uh, is coming back again. Uh, uh, so uh, history, I think, does have some uses and uh, uh, it's, it's interesting uh, and also scary to think of some of these rather cyclical developments. Thank you. Thank you, Harris, for a fascinating talk. That was really wonderful. Um, if anyone has any questions, please feel free to post them in the chat or raise your hand uh, and then I can allow people to talk if they, if they raise their hand. I just wanted to get things started off. Um, as, you, as you mentioned during the book and in your talk, uh, one of the sort of key features of the bank's independence was the separation of the responsibilities for monetary policy and financial policy. And, and obviously the sort of Bank of England is the ultimate lender of last resort. And so you might think there are obvious reasons why you'd want to have those responsibilities together in the same institution. But then on the other hand, you can think of you know, potential conflicts between um, goals of financial regulation versus goals of monetary policy. And I wanted to sort of press you a little more on what your view was on, on whether that separation was a good idea, whether it hindered the bank's ability to respond to the financial crisis, even though that's a little bit after the end of your book. But I'd just be sort of fascinated to hearing a little bit more on your thoughts about that sort of wisdom of separating those two functions versus having them in the same institution. Well, the... Um... The, the, the argument for separation um, was exactly the one that you you, you just raised. Um, th th that is that there's a potential conflict um, if you're responsible for supervision um, and and for for, for regulation. Um, it, 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 then uh, you might be tempted, for instance, uh, to push for a looser monetary policy so that you wouldn't expose uh, the financial institutions uh, to, uh, to a shock. And you know, indeed, that some of that comes up in the early 90s because the early 90s are a, a, a period of um, uh, tight monetary policy. That's the, the, the aftermath of the um, entry into the European monetary system at a moment when Germany was uh, being united and where the, the, um, the monetary response to a big um, uh, de demand shock was to, to tighten. Um, and uh, th th that makes life very difficult for the for, for financial institutions. So um, you know, in, the, in those circumstances, you would uh, go for a, a, a laxer um, policy. Um, uh, I, I, I think uh, fundamentally the bank's view, which was that these two belong together, uh, w was was more plausible, and um, th th that was that was also a view that the, uh, the the bank pushed in the early 1990s in the European discussions about the design of the European Central Bank at Maastricht, uh, that they wanted a European Central Bank that did banking supervision and uh, you would have, I think, um, had a, a better set of outcomes in the, in the 2000s if you had had that. Um, but it, 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 it looked uh, very difficult, it looked inappropriate um, in the sense that the Bank of England, you know, just at this moment, uh, came into the big BCCI scandal. Um, and so 
it looked as if it had failed in its mandate and it looked as if the idea of getting monetary uh, policy in one place and uh, uh, the financial supervision and regulation in another place uh, quite separated uh, was uh, was a better one um, because the, the, the regulators would then be free to pay more attention to regulatory issues. Um, but I, I, I think the, the the original vision was correct, and it was correct indeed to, you know, after after uh, two thousand and eight, both in Britain and in Europe, to get central banks to go back into financial supervision. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Harold. Thank you. And I, I know that Torsten Slock uh, has a question as well. And Torsten, you should be able to speak now. Yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, that's really fascinating. Thanks so much, Harold. Uh, just one very important issue today, as you know, is the unanchoring of inflation expectations. And I was wondering, um, in the 1960s in particular, what was the reason why inflation expectations became unanchored? Was it simply just that the economy was overheating? Uh, or what was this the nature of the unanchoring? Was it associated with this more intimate link between monetary and fiscal policy? Or, or what should we be looking at today, if you will, uh, as a trigger for whether inflation expectations are becoming unmoored or unanchored relative to where they have been for the last many decades? Um, it's, 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 it's a great question. I think the, um, you, you know, the, the, the question for me is uh, how you treat one-off shocks and, um, whether you think that this demands a big fiscal response um, and then whether you lay down circumstances and conditions in which you exit from that uh, the, the, that uh, accommodation. And so you know, I think uh, faced by the oil price shock or faced by the, uh, the, the, the COVID shock, the, the fiscal response is, is, is right. Uh, but what you what you didn't have in the 1970s was any sense of an exit strategy from that. And uh, the, the question now is to find an exit strategy. So if you don't find an exit strategy, the risk of a de-anchoring of inflation expectations, I think, is a, is a, is a, is a considerable one. Thank, thank you, Harold. And then uh, Michael Venschlag also had a question uh, where he, he sort of argues that, in his view, the period covered by your book was one in which the City of London returned as a global financial centre. And he wondered if you thought that the Bank of England played a very active role in that resurgence of London um, as a great financial centre and what your interpretation is of their role in, in promoting London as a global financial centre. Um, yes, uh, I, I mean, that's, uh, th th that's correct. Um, it, it starts with the uh, story of the um, ending of capital controls in 1979. Before that, London had been really important as a kind of offshore centre. But once the capital controls are ended, you can you can, you can really bring uh, Britain in. Um, and then the second stage of it is the um, deregulation in Big Bang in, in 1986. And um, what Big Bang does is to remove. The, um, the kind of functional division. So uh, for instance, between stockbroking and uh, stock jobbing. And uh, it, it, it leads to uh, the quick emergence of really big financial conglomerates that do a range of financial services across the board. And uh, the most important ones uh, are all non-British actually, they're uh, US banks that come into London. Um, uh, yes, the Bank of England promoted it, um, and uh, it, it's 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 in, in, in indeed a, a, a kind of success story in, in, in that sense that the um, uh, you know the, the, uh, that's why in in 1990 when they're talking about the purposes of the Bank of England they're talking about the a promotion of financial services in the in the in the, in the UK, um, but it it really poses a series of challenges to the old way of doing things. Um, so uh, the uh, you know the London market had depended on functional supervision uh, 
uh, from the middle of the 19th century until the 1980s. Um, and in that world, uh, you have people doing a really small part of a financial operation, but their capital is at stake, so they need to keep an eye on what's going on in other institutions. And uh, the, the, the discount houses, for instance, are very, very lightly capitalized. Um, so they're very endangered and uh, they really need to look at what the banks are doing. Um, they don't want to run unnecessary risks. And so essentially um, you know, what the functional division did uh, was to make a, a central regulatory and supervisory body uh, redundant. You didn't need one. Uh, but once you get big financial institutions, uh, then how do you do the regulation? And in a sense, BCCI um, brought that up very clearly in a, in, a, in a kind of way that anticipated some of the issues of 2008, uh, because um, this was an institution whose major operations um, occurred legally out of a unit that was domiciled in Luxembourg. Um, uh, and in order to regulate BCCI properly, you had to have a a triangular negotiation between the Luxembourg, the Swiss and the London regulators. And they really didn't know how to do that. And uh, they, they were very, very poor in doing that. Thank you, Harold. And then Michael Buda has a question or slash comment um, saying that he agrees that the 60s and 70s are an obvious historical precedent for an inflationary period. Uh, but so is the period immediately after the Second World War. And he sort of wondered about your thoughts on that. Well, the, the, the period after the Second World War is 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 fascinating, but um, you know that's uh, you, there's a much more obvious way of uh, dealing with big, uh, uh, very very high uh, debt levels, um, uh, which is that uh, you know all these debt levels occur in a context in which. There, there are uh, uh, limits, um, strict regulation of capital movement, and so um, uh, you know the, the, the effective control of uh, the, the, the the capital markets um, mean that it's 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 easy to reduce debt levels um, with relatively low rates of inflation, uh, but the in, uh, the debt is inflated away, and so if you look at the the history of uh, UK debt or um, US debt, you can see in the UK it's very high after the Napoleonic Wars, high after the First World War, high after the Second World War, and the the speed with which it's reduced after the Second World War is only possible in this this context of a um, a uh, financial repression of, of the um, uh, uh, so, so you, you know you ha you have the uh, uh, Bank of England that's part of this government uh, treasury bank nexus. And uh, one of the bank's missions is to make the debt management possible. And that, that means getting lower interest rates on the, on the debt. Interesting. And then um, Julian Pinter has a question as well, um, arguing that many consider that political pressures on central banks will increase over the next few years, in part because of the large debt increases uh, in line with your, what you were discussing a moment ago. And so his question is, uh, to what extent do you think that such political pressures uh, will be relevant to the Bank of England looking forward? And uh, how do you think that the Bank of England will be different from other large central banks in handling these, these political pressures? Well, I, 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 I think in part that's uh, not only a question about the future, it's also a question about the, uh, the, the, the past um, in, in the sense that um, the, the, the new environment really emerges uh, after 2008, uh, after, after the global financial crisis. And um, once you get the involvement of the bank in uh, large rescue operations, once you get the involvement of the bank in um, uh, the purchases of uh, securities, um, you're in effect doing a kind of fiscal policy. And so the clear uh, break, the separation uh, that had been part of the vision of 97, 98 um, disappears in that world. And um, if you're saying um, 
you know, that this kind of asset should be bought rather than that kind of asset if we should uh, be pushing some particular industry rather than another industry. Uh, those are issues of public policy and the demand uh, for a parliamentary in, in, in the British system for a parliamentary um, uh, control of that uh, will be much greater. The, 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 the beauty of the vision of 97 uh, was that it was very, very simple, that a very simple narrow function monetary policy uh, was being delegated to an institution that would be then responsible uh, for uh, reporting if it had allowed inflation to move outside a particular range. Thank you, Harold. And then um, Tiger Gao has a question as well. Tiger, hopefully you should be able to unmute mute yourself now. Oh. Thanks so much for your presentation, Professor James. Uh, I, I just have, I guess, two somewhat related questions. One is, what do you see as the turning point that kind of kicked off this global trend of financialization? I mean, uh, some say maybe it's when uh, the euro dollar market in Britain took off in the 1970s, which ended up creating tons of um, uh, unregulated global capital flows, in some states, because the West started to struggle with income-based growth and had to switch to finance-based growth. So I think uh, I wanted to hear a little bit more of your thoughts on the genesis of this and also where you kind of see things headed, because uh, you showed the chart of the, the historically low inflation and yield. So, so it, it seems that very irrational for us to believe that this low yield environment would go on for another five to 10 years. But on the other hand, to, to think that things would get any better in the next five to 10 years also seems very rational given the long historical trend and cycle. So uh, wh where do you see things headed? Thank you. Oh, goodness. Uh, I mean, there, there are so many parts of that question. Um, uh, it, it, it's a great question, but um, uh, answering it would be uh, sort of practically a, a sort of book length uh, um, uh, uh, presentation. Um, I mean, wh wh where it started in the in the in the nineteen seventies. Um, yes, I mean, I, I I think the the origins of it are actually very much with the, um, the 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 question of how to respond to the the oil price shock in the early nineteen seventies and seventy three seventy four uh, was a combination of you know trying to use market power from the point of view of the oil producers and then using market power as a political instrument, uh, because it, this was in the aftermath of the, uh, the, the, the conflict in the, in the Middle East, uh, the, the Yom Kippur War. Um, and um, it, the, the, there was a real discussion at that time, uh, you know, should, should uh, the industrial countries, um, the, first, the first ever of these superpower um, summits, uh, not superpower, uh, uh, big industrial countries uh, summits. It was five countries originally. Uh, G5 uh, it became the G7 later, it was in 1975. And uh, th that was exactly the theme there, um, how to deal with that. Um, uh, should you, um, should you, for instance, use military force against the, um, uh, the, the uh, Arab countries that were imposing these boycotts? Um, and uh, the solution that was pushed then by Henry Kissinger was, was sort of quite an interesting one. He said, no, 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 uh, you, you, you want to get them to buy into the system. So uh, you know, let's encourage them to um, recycle the, uh, the, the big surpluses because they couldn't spend the surpluses immediately. And, and then they'll have an interest in the maintenance of the Western financial system. Uh, they'll be brought in. Um, and, and the size of these these markets just exploded in the in the, in the aftermath of of, of, of that. Um, so you know, that's that, that that's really the story of the origins of that, and that is is also a 1970s uh, story. Um, and then your other question is, um, you know, are we going to see this kind of low interest rate environment? Uh, continue you know is it is it plausible um some people have sketched out uh, there's, a, there's an economist at yale who's worked also quite a bit at the bank of england uh, called paul schmelzing who has uh, written about uh, the decline of interest rates over a very very long period of time over hundreds of years um that's right um but in 
in in in periods where there's a, there's a kind of break uh, where there's a lot of uh, uh, government debt, um, uh, also maybe where there's a lot of innovation, uh, you 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 get uh, interruptions of this this long run uh, tendency. And uh, my guess would be that that's exactly where you're headed at the moment. That first of all. Um, yes, there's a lot more government debt. Um, and secondly, um, adapting to the, uh, the, the, the COVID uh, pandemic is, 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 is going to unleash a whole series of new technologies. Um, and so we, 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 we may well find uh, growth picking up again uh, very considerably. In that case, we would really expect interest rates to rise dramatically. Thank you, Harold. And then um, this question may be a little unfair. I'd like to ask one more myself, but it's sort of looking a little further ahead beyond the period of your book. I was sort of curious um, about the future of the City of London post-Brexit. And so obviously um, the, the Brexit agreement doesn't involve the single market, um, raises a lot of concerns about uh, London's continuation as a global financial centre. Some activities have moved to, to a number of continental European countries already. Um, but sort of looking ahead, you could sort of see two routes forward. On the one hand, this could be advantageous to the City of London because it's free to choose its own financial regulation in response to new financial developments and new, new asset opportunities. On the other hand, of course, there may be pressure to comply uh, to some degree with European directives uh, to try to maintain some form of access in, into European markets. And so I was just sort of curious what your thoughts were for the Bank of England looking ahead and feel free to pass on this if it's sort of a little unfair because I know it's way beyond the, the topic of your book, but it, I think it's a fascinating question and any kind of insights from the period um, studied in your book would be very interesting. I, 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 I mean, it is, a, it is a fascinating question and um, uh, uh, you know, for, for, for first of all, on the history of it, um, in the 90s, when uh, Europe was moving to this uh, this, this uh, monetary union and with the um, free capital flows in in, in Europe, um, there, there was a lot of attention in the Bank of England uh, to making sure that if Britain wasn't part of the monetary union, and most people in the bank were pretty skeptical of the monetary union, uh, but uh, the uh, British uh, financial uh, industry should be really tied into this. Um, and, uh, you know, I, th I think you will find people in, in the city um, who stand on both sides of the choices that you, you had. Uh, so first of all, uh, from the point of view of big banks and big financial institutions, um, uh, they're, they're, they're deeply worried about um, losing out. Um, uh, uh, hedge funds are really enthusiastic about the lighter regulation possibility. Um, and, um, you, you know, I, th I think, um, I'm not sure whether historical analogies are uh, so helpful here. Um, uh, you, you know, what, what seems to me to be also at stake is uh, geographical analogies. So, you know, one of the favorite uh, geographical analogies is with Singapore and uh, the, the, the image of a kind of relatively lightly regulated um, offshore um, market is uh, the, 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 the one that gets appealed to um, if you have the optimistic view of uh, what, what might happen after um, after, after the um, in, in our current environment, um, but you know you 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 have to think also that uh, uh, Singapore is bound to have a good relationship with the PRC. Uh, you 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 can't um, you you can't really exist as a lightly regulated offshore place and have a terrible relationship with uh, the big power that's sitting next to you. And Switzerland has noticed this uh, very acutely that, um, uh, that they're, they're actually being pushed uh, very, very sharply by uh, European Union regulations. Thank you, Harold. That was absolutely fascinating. And I guess to, to stay on time to our 1.15 uh, end time, um, I just wanted to thank you for a really wonderful uh, book presentation and a fascinating discussion with all the questions and discussion afterwards. So thank you very much indeed. Thank you. It's great being with you. Thank you all.